Hello and welcome to our weekly chat. This week's topic is patient rights and it's very, very important. It's important for you to know as an upcoming healthcare professional and it's also important for you to know because no matter what, at some point in time, we each become patients and we have loved ones who are patients and we need to know what these rights are because the only way you can make sure you are getting the benefits of your rights is to ensure you know that you have them. So the, um, the ECA law, the Affordable Care Act, includes a patient bill of rights. Now, if you are doing research on this, you should note that this was 2010 and you wanna make sure that you are reading that and not an old patient bill of rights, which is no longer valid. But this patient bill of rights includes very important things pertinent to our lives in the 21st century. This requires insurance plans to cover people with pre-existing health conditions. If you are young, wonderful, but you may not remember or have lived through a time when individuals with chronic health conditions could not get health insurance because of their pre-existing condition or women could not get insurance to cover the pregnancy because they were already pregnant when they applied or got hired by a company. Also, pre-existing health conditions might be covered, but the coverage would be for everything else except anything related to that one condition. And that's a real problem with a condition such as diabetes mellitus, which has so many manifestations that affect the heart and um, all aspects, the kidneys, um, of the body that it almost is nothing left except the common cold, maybe, okay? Or COVID, I guess. But COVID, having pre-existing conditions would make it worse, so let's not get into that. All right. Also, the ACA Patient Bill of Rights ensures that anybody with any insurance coverage will get free preventive care. That's mammograms, that's PSA testing, that's um, annual checkups, that's uh, all kinds of things. And you can go and Google um, free preventive care. It comes from the United States federal government, uh, flu shots, uh, COVID shots, okay? All of that is free, as in no money. Mm -hmm. from the patient anyway. The facilities still get paid from the federal government. Um, it gives young adults more coverage options, including anyone living at home up to the age of 25 or 26 can stay on their parents' health insurance policy, which is a big benefit. OK, and no more lifetime, no more yearly dollar limits on coverage of essential health benefits. And, you know, if you are just coming into the portion of adulthood where you as a patient have to make these decisions about insurance, then the good news is you're walking into this already. But for those who are 30 or 40 years old or older, we remember what it was like before. And these are so very important improvements and guarantees from the federal government to cover patient health care. 
Okay. Um, in addition, the Bill of Rights holds insurance companies accountable for rate increases, meaning they can't just willy-nilly increase the rate of the premium, which is very important, okay? You know, you sign on for uh, a health insurance policy at a certain amount every month. Um, you need that for your own personal budgeting. And um, so this makes insurance companies responsible or accountable is is the proper word and um that means that they have to answer questions but if that happens to you you have to complain you have to let them know otherwise nobody's holding them accountable okay it is illegal now for a health insurance company to cancel your health insurance just because you get sick I know, doesn't, isn't that ridiculous? But, it, you know, you may know people who um, may get in a little fender bender with their, and they don't want to report it to their auto insurance company because they don't want their prices, their premiums to go up or to get canceled. Now it's illegal for health insurance companies to cancel a patient's policy just because they got sick. And that again is reinforced with the no no um, prejudice due to pre-existing conditions. Okay, this Bill of Rights protects your choice of doctors. In other words, you have the right to choose who your doctor is. And I don't know if you have applied for an HMO recently. But sometimes the HMO will assign a primary care physician to you. So it's important that you know, you don't have to stick with that doctor if you don't want to. You may request a change as long as you are changing to another doctor who is part of, you know, who is participating in that, that HMO, okay? And, this Bill of Rights protects you from employer retaliation. And so this means that your employer cannot fire you or um, penalize you because you are not well. Very, very important. And, you know, I mean, under normal circumstances, um, unless you're calling in sick on a regular basis, this would not come into play because the employer has no right to see your, that's another law, right? HIPAA. They have no right to see your medical records. Okay. This also covers breastfeeding equipment and support. And um, for you women out there, this equipment can be very expensive. So the good news is it's going to be covered under your policy. Birth control methods and counseling covered under your policy. Mental health and substance abuse services. This carries the Mental Health Parity Act one step further and automatically blends it into your health care plan and the right to appeal a health plan decision. So this is important for you to know is just because they say denied does not mean the conversation is over. And we have found that quite a number of appeals go on the side of the patient. So it's important that you know that you have the right to do this and not just accept no for an answer. And you also have the right to choose an individual marketplace plan rather than one your employer offers you. So just because your employer offers you a specific plan, if you don't like that plan, you can go shopping on the marketplace. And if you like one there better, you have the right to take that one. You are not forced to accept your employer's offer um, offering. 
okay? And very often you can get a better plan. So, and you might say, well, my, my employer pays part, but so you got to know that, know what you would have to pay out of pocket and then go shopping and then make your decision. And I did that. I had, I had a policy through the marketplace that I really, really liked. And I started working at this other university and they had a, uh, a, an insurance plan that they offered me. And the one I had was much better and I didn't want to give it up. So I just refused the plan that my employer offered me. The, the point is, is that you need to have health, health insurance. And you also have the right to find the best deal the best price out of pocket, as well as the best providers and the best coverage that's right for you because everyone is different. It's just the way it is, right? Okay, so that's Patient Bill of Rights. And I also wanted to review the False Claims Act because we're getting toward the end of this this course. And I just wanted to remind you of the importance of the False Claims Act, considering you are all medical record coding professionals to be. Okay. This is a federal law that has state mini-me's. Okay. What that means is the False Claims Act can only make the submission of a claim to a federal agency containing false information and illegal acts. So that would be Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, pretty much, okay? Um, so each individual state passed its own version that says it's illegal to submit a claim with false information to any health insurance company doing business in our state. So this means that if you are involved in submitting a claim with false information, it's illegal on federal as well as state law. This magnifies fines, magnifies penalties, and magnifies the consequences. Now you might say, well, I wouldn't do that. Okay, but we know it happens. You know, a supervisor will come in and say, here's, here's the super bill for this patient. And uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, the doctor said to use these codes. And you look at the documentation and it's not supported and you say, but the documentation does not support this. I can't file these codes. And they say, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, do it. And you know, ethics is a wonderful thing to have, but we also know that sometimes life circumstances can erode our internal strengths for standing up for what is right. You may not be able to afford to lose your job. You may worry about repercussions. That's all very human, okay? But the fact is, is that an organization which encourages you to commit fraud is not one you wanna work for. So perhaps you do it and then quickly update your resume and go shopping for a new job. Perhaps the choice that I like better is you go to the supervisor or the physician or both and you say, let me educate you, this is, illegal. Let me explain to you why this is not a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. This is literally illegal 
federally as well as within our state. We can't do this. Let's find another way to help this patient. Okay. There are always legal alternatives to illegal acts. The illegal acts tend to be a little faster, a little easier, a little smoother until the auditors come knocking at your door and put those bracelets. And I don't mean the nice, like a tennis bracelet. I mean like handcuffs. And remember, someone who is unethical enough to ask you to put illegal false information on a claim form is not a stand-up guy or girl, okay? They're not going to stand in front of the judge and say, Your Honor, I told her to do it under threat of losing her job. It's all on me. No, 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 no. These cowards are more likely to say, hey, I hired her or him with their, their certification and coding. I don't know how to code. What do I know? Yeah, maybe I wrote that down, but it was a suggestion as she's the expert. He's the expert. They're going to throw you under the bus fast and furious. So you got to stand up for yourself fast and furious. Okay. And remember the knowledge requirement of the False Claims Act. We talked about this earlier this semester, term, whatever, is the fact is, is that the law states an individual who knows or should know that the information is false. You are an educated, certified coder. There's no way this is not at least a should know. You should know that this is wrong. So therefore you have no defense. Stand up for the truth. What goes around comes around. When you stand up for the truth, you have the truth to protect you. And it may be a little bumpy at first, but the but the 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 truth is that physicians do not learn about these things in medical school. They don't know the way you're learning now, which is why it's so important for you to learn. And then you can go and educate them. Okay. And if you want, email me well, after you're on the job, after you graduate, email me and I'll give you the actual website where this is stated in the law. So you have proof positive that stands on your side. And not to mention the fact that how many times have you gotten a bill for a denied claim? If it was small enough, you probably paid it and said, oh, Retsuka, 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 Retsuka. Those insurance companies never pay for anything, even though I pay my premium every month, okay? You may not know for a fact that it was the insurance company that did you wrong. It very well could have been the coder or the doctor. Mm -hmm. That's why I want you to know this and understand this. So you can go forward, go out there into the world and say, no, we're going to stop this fraud. And save everybody money. Not to mention a good night's sleep. That's important too. Okay, very important. Now, I also want to remind you about the key TAM law, which is included in HIPAA. It's known also as the whistleblower statute. And it empowers you to report this facility to bring a lawsuit because they are not complying with the law, try to get you to do it, but you're gonna stand up and you're gonna say, look, I have copies, I have evidence.
you want to be able to do good in this world. And this is a good thing. Not to mention the fact that once the lawsuit is done, any money that the Fed, federal government or the state government recoup as a result of the key, key TAM lawsuit, you get anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. And some of these lawsuits are in the tens of millions of dollars. There was one whistleblower in New York State who got something like $3 million. Mm -hmm. Now, it takes a whole bunch of years. So this is not a, oh, I need some money to pay the rent this month kind of thing. But more importantly, this is you standing up for what is right. No more going along. No more, well, that's the way they do things. Maybe I don't know. Well, if you're not sure, email me. I'll be happy to let you know. I'll be happy to give you sources to stand on your side. And another thing, it's much easier to get a job when you lost your job because you stood up for what was legal than for losing your job because the facility closed because the government shut them down for fraudulent claims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter whose fault it is, think about it. You're a coding supervisor. You're looking to hire new coders and somebody walks in and on their resume is they worked for this hospital that has just been fined $25 million for submitting false claims under the False Claims Act. You're gonna hire this person? Yeah, I didn't think so. So you decide. All right, read chapter 13, cause it's fun. Cause it's filled with knowledge. And because that's your assignment and then you're gonna have a homework assignment and a quiz. And a Federal False Claims Act summary is a really good, very short, sweet, but to the point. And remember as a coder, this, this is your law. Okay. All right. Anything I can do for you, any questions I can ask for you, anything I can clarify for you, email me. I'm happy to help you understand. Okay. Have a great day.